draft physics video, <clears throat> um, probably in the Hathaway series, I suppose, but it's on the specific subject of why light moves slower in glass or water or other mediums. And he played clips from this video. I just want to play a little bit from the beginning of the video um, as to their reasoning for their explanations. So let's understand. He provides three different inf explanations and one of the explanations has in it something called a politron, I think. So some new <laughs> elemental particle that somehow has a larger mass and therefore can't move as fast and it transmits the light and, you know, so they're just making stuff up basically. And then the other video by the other guy is linked here. Um, and I think they've switched it. His original video was more about energy levels of electrons and the new video is saying that somehow the energy is spread out over something or other and it sort of influences the electrons but doesn't hit the electrons or you know it's just convoluted and um, <clears throat> so yes really poor explanations frankly <laughs> and um, and Hathaway is using this as evidence that somehow my theory is flawed because they have no consistent theory and their theories are completely undetailed. And it's just, like I said, I keep pointing out how this is just an insane double standard he's applying here. An insane double standard. Alright, so let's play some of this. Do a video about refractive index, uh, N, because it actually has a symbol at the bottom of anything else, but also because it's something where we've done quite a lot of videos which mention refractive index and we talk about the speed of light when it's going through the medium through glass or something like that, and we talk about the speed of light slowing down, and invariably when we do that, there's this sort of firestorm in the comments to the video, all about people saying, ah, oh, but photons always travel at the speed of light, what's going on, why does the speed of light slow down, and so on. Um, right, and... You know, a lot of this, you know, you can go all the way back to Newton. Newton did a ton of experiments on it with glass and really kind of sophisticated stuff in the sense that he figured out that if you polish glass, you know, and you make it, you know, um, thinner, you change its thickness, let's just say, thicker or thinner, that it goes through cycles. So as you go thinner, it becomes more and more and more reflective and then all of a sudden it becomes less and less and less reflective. So it will reflect light 16% at one point and 0% at certain thicknesses. And that cycling just keeps happening. So you could go, you could make a piece of glass 10 meters thick and the same effect will take place. You can just polish it a little bit and you'll change its reflective index on its surface. Um, you know, which is really um, you'd have to explain and and my explanation is is because you're polishing off atoms whole atoms you can't break the atoms you can't break the nuclear forces so what you're doing is changing the surface in the sense of the alignment of the surface atoms and that changes the reflectivity because you're you have a consistent bumps versus inconsistent ones you know so the atoms are sticking up at different levels and uh, the idea is as you polish that down you remove the reflective bits until you get to some point where you have the least reflectivity um, and my point is also that what you do on one side of the glass actually has an implication on the other side of the glass so if you actually do push some atom down that down will go all the way to the other side of the glass and make it up <laughs> So you can't, um, the geometry of the glass is very rigid, I guess is the point being made. And the alignment of the atoms is very, very specific. They're, they're, they're at a pattern to each other. And you can't change that pattern. You can't make them align up in a different way than how they line up. The geometry is strict. So that would be my argument. And that's just context for what he's going to say next. Um, so I wanted to try and explain what's going on and the fact that the speed of light really does slow down when you go into a medium. Right, so he says so. The other professor says no, it doesn't slow down. The photons themselves are um, absorbed and readmitted 
that was his old explanation. It's the same, similar now, but it's he's, he's added a vagueness to it in terms of the atoms themselves absorb the light, and then the atoms themselves readmit the light. That kind of nonsense. In crude terms, if you measure the speed of light in a vacuum, you always end up with the same answer: uh, three hundred thousand kilometers per second, or we're about to see. Okay. If you measure the speed of light in something else, air, glass, whatever it is, you get an answer. The, the refractive index is just defined as the ratio of those two numbers. So, for example... Right, so the refractive index is just the number they give to transparent object <laughs> mediums um, and how much longer it takes for light to get through the, that medium. And again, I would argue that it takes longer because it travels a longer path. And that's the only reason it takes longer. The refractive index of glass is typically around 1.4, which means that uh, light travels about 40% slower in glass than it does in a vacuum. That much? Yeah. I always imagined it was just like a minuscule change. No, so in air, it's like it's, you know, it's a fraction of a percent. So air really is the speed of light, really is very close to the speed of light. But in air. Right. Now, you can see that air, okay, as a substance, is not dense at all. Very undense. Very few atoms. So we go back to this. The Earth to an apple is the same as an apple to an atom. But air isn't apple or earth. Air is really, really thin atoms. So that ratio doesn't apply to a bucket full of air. The apple and atom metaphor is to something similarly material as dense as, say, earth rather than atmosphere. So the atmosphere is many, many times more less densely populated by atoms and so the reason why air is as transparent as it is is because it doesn't you're less likely to hit something traveling through that medium the light actually travels through it without perhaps hitting any atoms in a, in a fairly dense material like glass, yes, it's about 40% slower in the glass than it would be in a vacuum. So, I mean, it's responsible for all sorts of things. The reason why when you look through glass, you know, when you look at a straw in a glass of water, you see that the, the, the straw appears to be bent and so on. Okay, so he says the density of the glass, I mean, or the reflective index of the glass. See, they're using a term for a surface phenomenon and applying it to the thickness of the phenomenon. And that, I think, is just an inappropriate thing. Okay, I mean, refractive indexes have to do, in my opinion, their surface phenomena, and that's sort of what Newton um, proved, in my opinion. And it really doesn't have anything to do with <laughs> the interior of the medium, except that it's always about transitioning between two levels of, of medium. So when you go from this, the surface condition to another molecular condition, that's why the angle changes. All right. Um, so how's another way to say that? Uh, but anyway, I, I would assert that talking about things, how things reflect or deflect as they go into a substance, is different than talking about how it travels through the substance. Uh, so all these things to do with the paths of light being bent. Are, are all to do with what happens when light goes from um, one refractive, a medium with one refractive index to a medium with un another refractive index, so from, for example from air to glass or air to water. Right, and, and you can just, you know, logically you can say to yourself, well, that medium transition can't have anything to do with inside the glass or inside the air. It has to do with the, the transition point, and that's where the action is. The event happens at the transition, the event doesn't happen in the glass. I do so, and you know, they wouldn't work if it weren't for a refractive index because of that. Right, so he's saying glasses wouldn't work because of a reflective index and blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and the only truth to that is is that you could, you could make glasses out of glass on the surface and fill the interior with water and you'd still have a perfectly functional pair of glasses. Or you could fill it with any other transparent medium that had a high density. And you'd have the same effect. So again, it's not the glass doing it, the thickness of the glass that's creating the effect. It's the angle of the glass to 
the light coming in. So it's this circumstance. When the light comes in straight, it's going to hit molecules in a certain condition and move them in a certain direction into a geometric grid. Now, if it comes in at an angle, it's going to move them in a different direction in that geometric grid, and so it's going to have a different likely effect. That would be my argument, that the surface isn't smooth or flat or any of those kinds of things, that the surface has a, um, a structure, and that structure imposes an, a consequence. What bends the light, right? And so I say, yes, the lenses wouldn't work. So lots and lots of physics really depends on refractive indices. So right, again, so it's not the refractive indice that it's dependent on. It's just dependent on you not changing the refractive indice in between the surfaces. So the surfaces are causing the effect, and as long as you don't change the density of atoms or the transmission material in between the two pieces of glass, you would still have a lens. But this always comes up with people say, oh, well, you know, so people are quite reasonably happy with the idea of waves and maybe the waves slow down. But then you start thinking about photons, like particles of light. Uh, and there's this view that a photon always travels at the speed of light. And so when people start thinking about this and say, well, how can it be when you've got your photons going through, if you think of the photon picture, when you've got your photons going through glass, why is it that, that they take longer to come out the other side? So the picture a lot of people have, let me draw a picture for you. So the picture... Right, so this is the picture he doesn't think is correct. What a lot of people have is I've got a material rather than a vacuum, so I've got lots of atoms in there. The atoms that make up, or maybe they'll be in a lattice if it's a solid, or they'll be... <clears throat> so again, it's really not about atoms, it's about electrons and protons, so he's also a layer too big to really understand where the light's going through. The light's traveling the subatomic particles, it's not traveling atomic particles. Randomly distributed if it's water, or, you know, but there'll be just a bunch of atoms. So a picture a lot of people have. Okay, and they won't be randomly organized, so again that's another just completely wrong understanding. Even atoms are strictly in positions. The molecules and the chemistry of, you know, combining oxygen and carbon, they have certain rules about how they'll be configured. And those rules are as dramatic as the difference between a diamond and soot from a candle. Both are carbon, both are pretty pure carbon, and clearly very different in terms of what happens when light hits them. Completely different results because of the strict geometric obligations of how they are put together. You can put them together very, very differently and get a very, very different effect. So I, this idea of just randomizing things, um, when we're talking about specific hard materials that are transparent, so they're densely packed atoms, they're rigid in their positions, there is no fluidity, you know, is my particle of light comes in and kind of does a, a, a sort of um, a, a pinball. Pinball, that's the word I was looking okay, so, so a picture a lot of people have is the light comes in and does a sort of pinball thing of bouncing around okay, and then coming out the other side. And <clears throat> so, like I said, so this is an example of what physics does really badly. Is it takes an idea it has dismissed and then it, com it very poorly paraphrases it to keep pointing out how it must be wrong. So instead of giving it a fair argument, they do this simplistic na da 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 that doesn't really represent the atomic structure. So like I said, we know glass is highly rigid in the atomic structure and that it has a very consistent atomic structure. So the same pattern is completely repeated. So once you initiate something, you can imagine that it, unlike a pinball machine, or at least unlike something with a lot of crap in it, it has a very rigid pattern and that the angles would be very, very precise in terms of the arrangement of the material. That is, if you went in this way, you would leave 90 degrees this way, and 90 degrees from this way would be this way, and 90 degrees from that way would be this way, and 90 degrees from that way would be that way. And the only thing that would decide how big or sl how much slower you were traveling the straight line would be how close those atoms were to each other. So the closer they are compacted, the faster the light would travel. And then that would explain why 
say, lead crystal, the light travels slower than in um, unleaded crystal, that kind of thing. Every kind of glass has a slightly different index, and that slightly different index might be because there's a little more distance between the atoms and a little less distance between the atoms. So a lot of things are explained by this model that he just dismisses by just doing this trashy little, <laughs> you know, kind of an unfair paraphrase. That sort of makes sense, right? Because if this thing is still traveling at the speed of light, obviously now it's traveled a longer path to get out the other side, and therefore it should take longer to come out the other side. <clears throat> the problem with that is if you think about it, if, so take these glasses, uh, take glasses and... Right, so if you think about it, right, there's so many ways you can think about it. So he's going to use a couple of examples, and I'll just point out how he didn't really think that all the way through. Example where you've got this refractive index of around 1.4. That means that the path the thing has to travel along has to be something like, instead of traveling straight through, it has to travel you know, 40% further. That means it has to be sort of traveling on paths like this, right, in order to come out the other side 40% slower. Right, and you, he could have done it the favor of just having it go in at this angle and then come out at the same angle, because the angle would be preserved. But he didn't do that. Because that's the angle that typically you have to be going for this path to be about 40% longer than the straight through path. Okay. Okay. The problem with that is that that would mean that some of the light will do that and some of the light will come in and bounce this way and this way and this way and this way. And okay, so again, there's nothing to indicate it would do that. It would come in in some different way. The molecular structure, like I said, is very rigid. So every line of these atoms, if you could almost say they were lined up like a magnet in the sense that every they, they would retain the same the same this kind of pattern but I mean the linear patterns could be very very rigid very precise so the only way you would hit is in one of those patterns I mean it's, it would be more complex than what I'm drawing I'm just drawing one property we know that the silicon and oxygen molecule is more complex than that in terms of how it's the, how, how they molecularly arrange into crystals that's why you get the flat facets and stuff. So they're almost like domains in a magnet. And that's what it's traveling through. So again, that was, you know, a trivialization of kind of an important detail. And end up coming out that way. So what you'd expect for the light coming out the far side in this case is that the light should all be heading out in all sorts of different directions. Just depend. Right. So he's saying there's no reason to think that the the surfaces are both consistent with each other and the stuff in between is consistently structured and the argument is that it is and that's why glass is transparent because it has that property that it like a like the the idea like the idea of a magnet being made of a bunch of little magnets inside and you cut those magnets and little magnet little magnet more it doesn't go all the way down it goes down to the uh, proton in the um, electron, but the idea of that being represented on levels is what glasses can also be understood to be doing. So that's one point I think it just trivializes. On you know, what, what it happened to bounce off last. And of course that's not what happens. If you shine a laser into a piece of glass, then the laser beam comes in one side and it comes out the other side, and it's still a laser beam, still all pointed in the same direction. So this picture really doesn't work. <clears throat> That's only that's right, but that's true for anything that's transparent. That's obviously got to have a very consistent structure for it to take what comes on one surface and duplicate it on the other surface. But that's all it's really doing. It's just taking whatever hits this surface and it's just guaranteeing that you have the same surface at the other end. And I would argue that just logically you can understand atoms kind of want to do that. Okay, in the, in in the sense that you can't again, you can't polished glass by breaking the atoms. You can't have a half a atom. Okay, and you could understand that if I tried to, if I tried, if I took a consistent system and I tried to push an atom into it just a little bit or halfway, that these forces are rigid and you, you can't do the halfway thing. You can't do half an atom sticks up. Either a whole atom sticks out or no atom, but it can't be a half a one, that kind of thing. There's rules like that. So he's just kind of denying molecular structure. Of thinking about this game of pinball going on, because if you start doing that, that should mean that the light really should be spreading out in all directions. But couldn't I? Uh, no, that's not the um, only reasonable conclusion. Think of it more as, instead of pinball, wading through treacle or honey, and I'm just walking more slowly because 
it's hard for my legs to move through this. Well, that would be an ether or something, so that's not even a viable question. So probably could have skipped this part. Viscous material. But then you have to, okay, so that's fine, but then you have to get, okay, so that's sort of a macroscopic view. Now let's go down to the microscopic view. What's happening? What's the light doing when it interacts with the atoms? And, and there, there is another possibility. Like the other possibility that could be going on is, again, here's a bunch of atoms, and it could be that the light's coming in, it's getting absorbed by one of these atoms, it then sits around for a little while until the atom chooses to re-emit the light. Okay, now it wouldn't just sit around for a little while. What would happen is, is this electron, so you see it keeps doing hitting atoms. It, it, light doesn't hit atoms. It, hit, it hits electrons. So, you know, and then the electron moves, okay, slowly, because the electron can't nearly go the speed of the light it absorbs until it meets more pressure from this, say, electron, because it starts moving close to this electron, and the repulsive force kicks in, all right? And the electron is forced to go back to the position it had, which means it has to readmit the photon. And it readmits it in some other direction. And then it hits a proton and leaves that at 90 degrees. And then it hits a proton and leaves that at 90 degrees. I mean, this is, this is just too trivial. Again, and send it on its way, and that's sort of at the microscopic level. That's this sort of what's going on in a, a treacly picture. That things are just being delayed as they're going through. Again, there's a couple of problems with that. I mean, we know that atoms do absorb atoms on their own absorb light, so this picture sort of works. That atoms do absorb light, and then they'll re-emit it some time later. Right, and again, it's not atoms absorbing the light. So again, I'm just going to say that you know this is physics. We we know an atom doesn't do anything in particular. The pieces inside of it do all the work. There's two problems with that. Firstly, atoms tend to absorb light at very specific frequencies. And so you would then expect your refractive index to affect those particular frequencies a lot because the atoms are... <clears throat> yes, and it does. So the refractive index does is different for different wavelengths of light. So that is true. <laughs> he thinks it should be more dramatic, I guess. But it's a fact. I mean, red light and blue light will travel at different speeds through a medium absorbing light at those particular frequencies, and other frequencies not very much at all. So that means that the refractive index should vary dramatically depending on exactly what... Yeah, well, we already know that media, that any chemical compound absorbs and reflects light of only specific frequencies. Everything's, there's, you know, mica is opaque to visible light, but completely transparent to ultraviolet light. Glass is uh, transparent to visible light and opaque and largely to um, infrared. What wavelength of light you're looking at. It doesn't happen that way. The fact of index does depend on the wavelength of light, but generally rather smoothly rather than this very independent discrete way. The second problem with that is that that is, again, fundamentally a kind of a stochastic process, a random process. How many atoms did you happen to bump into in your way through? And now, there won't be any happen to bump into. So again, we know the consistency of the medium is consistent. So I know that this battery None of the light's going through the battery. None of it. We, we know that the density of the material is thick enough that all the reflections are happening really close to the surface of this battery. Very little energy goes all the way, say, into the battery and then comes back as a photon. It doesn't reflect from the middle of the battery and then come back. So it have no chance of getting back because it end up hitting as much stuff come trying to go back as it did going forward. So glass is just as dense as this, so the density of the atoms on the surface of the glass is insanely high. An apple is to the earth what an atom is to an apple. Just think, there's a lot of apples in the earth, lots of stuff to hit. The photon isn't going to miss all the atoms and go through the glass at some super fast speed because the density is so high that even if it misses the first 10,000, you'd never be able to measure the difference because probability won't allow that to be a measurable difference. How long did each atom happen to delay the light for? Because how long a, 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 an atom takes to, when it absorbs a, a, a photon of light, how long it takes to re-emit it again is just a random process. So, so again, it's not random in some kind of way like we don't know the density of the atoms. We do know the density of the atoms, and so we do know what probability there is for a photon to be able to get 
this far through the surface of something. We know how we know how improbable it is that the photon will go unmolested to the other side. We know it's not possible. That means that how long it takes a photon to get through um, should just depend in a fairly sort of random way. Sometimes they'll get through very quickly, sometimes they'll have more of a problem. Again, that's not what you find. When you okay, so I'm just saying that's another, uh, uh, just, just washed right over a probability equation that seriously does not allow for any vagaries. You're talking about trillions of things, permutations, and you're talking about the the biggest difference could be like a number like 10,000. So 10,000 versus trillion. There's just no way you could measure that difference. You measure that how you, know, you first turn on a light through a block of glass and measure when the first light comes out the other side. It's always the same amount of time. So It's always, as far as we know, as far as, far as we can measure, the same amount of time. It's always uh, an amount of time within our margin of error, but that doesn't mean we've measured how many atoms it hit. And it, it certainly doesn't measure the probability, which is one, I'm saying if you do a trillion flippings of the coin, right, if you flip a coin a trillion times, you have, you'll eliminate any large irregularity in your results. So if you flip two, you sit two sessions flipping, you know, coins, you'll end up with a result that'll be plus or minus a hundred flips. As the outside, as the worst case scenario, there'll be a difference of a hundred flips. And the likely difference is going to be three. Three more heads over here than over there. Again, you can't have any kind of stochastic process like that going on. All right, then. You've so... Wrong answer. It's me that they're wrong. Tell me what's right. All oh, right, this is where life starts getting very complicated. Oh, good. Yeah, it's, that wasn't complicated enough. This is where things do start becoming a little more complicated because now we have to start thinking always with, with these microscopic systems. You can think about them classically or you can think about them in terms of quantum mechanics. And at some level, they're sort of... Uh, well, in, on some level, his classic explanations are not Newtonian, so I wouldn't call that classical. Um, they're certainly not particle. They're both wave interpretations. So he gives you wave interpretation A and wave interpretation B and wave interpretation three, three, but none of them have anything to do with just particles at a frequency. Both getting part of the picture. It's just like, you know, you can treat like, sometimes like a wave, sometimes like a particle. Um, so we need to think about both possibilities. So let's start with the classical end of things. Okay, he doesn't do any particle part. Okay, he already did the particle part, he dismissed it, and now he's just going to do wave physics. Wave end of things. What you've actually got in your solid is a whole bunch of atoms arranged in a lattice. As the light comes in as an electromagnetic wave, okay, it's basically a varying electric field. That's going to jiggle all the atoms in this thing because they've got charges and so on, so all the electrons are going to get pulled around. All right, so he's basically pointing out that, yes, all the atoms, they've got charges. So he's basically pointing out all of them are regulated in their position. One can't move without the others being their pressure changing. So it's a pressure lattice. It's a lattice of pressure. And something comes in, and it can be a, a particle or a wave, it doesn't matter. Something comes in to disturb the pressure. That's what's happening. So you don't, you don't have to make this wave mechanics or particle mechanics. You can just say something comes in to disturb the pressure lattice. By that electric field as it goes past. And that's going to, when you then start moving these electric charges around, that means that each atom is going to respond by producing electromagnetic waves of its own. Okay, so now he's going to talk about atoms again. As if the atoms have a function, and the atoms are made of electrons and protons. So you're disturbing an electron. That's not the atom. That's the electron. And the electron is bound to other protons that are in the centers of other atoms. So... The atoms are intimately connected to each other, yes, but they're only intimately connected to each other through the electrons and the protons. So again, instead of doing physics on the level that it's actually happening, which is electrons and protons, he's talking about atoms again. So the waves come in, they start jiggling the atoms around, which means that each of the waves will then start kind of oscillating in sympathy with the wave that's causing it. And it's the superposition of the wave coming in, coming through, the undisturbed wave, and all these sort of waves that are being created by the atoms that make up the material, when you add all those waves together, 
you end up with a, the final the wave that's actually propagating through the glass, and that wave is the one that's then travelling at less than the speed of light. So he's he's basically doing the some sort of two slit thing, like the little force comes in, somehow spreads all of its force across the whole thing, it gets to the end and it pops out in one location. Which isn't explained in any way whatsoever. So Hoffaday says this is some sort of explicit science. And there's nothing explicit in this at all. There's no explanation for how it spreads or how it's re it's re formed into a single photon popping out of the glass. So how do you do all of this stuff and then have a single thing pop out at the end? Now there was a part in this video I thought he did where he was talking about glasses being clear versus opaque. And we'll, we'll play a little bit more. I mean I don't really, really want to play this convoluted you know like I said, it's just mush. Um, and, and you know I just wanted to get to that part because that's another part that points out the distinction here is the scatter argument. Maybe it was just the scatter argument that made me think of that. So remember before when he's talking about how, well, you couldn't tell which way the light was going to come out. But see, that's again a giveaway in that it's a surface phenomenon. Because I can make that happen by roughing up the glass, taking a piece of sandpaper and, and, and abrading the surface. And then I can force the light to scatter in all directions. So again, clearly the clarity of the glass is dependent on the surface of the glass. For it to transmit light accurately, the surface has to be as pure as the interior. It, it can't have huge uh, uh, gouges cut in it. You know, you just gouge it, gouge out some of these atoms, and gouge out some atoms here, and gouge out some atoms here. Then all of a sudden, there's no transparency. There's no there's transparency only to the idea of light, but you'll get no image. So it, it will not travel in, in these nice, um, straight, uh, parallel kind of lines. All of a sudden, the lines become unparallel. So, you know, the image quality is lost because the image, the photon that comes in over here ends up coming out over here. And the photon that came in over here comes out here. And the photon that came in here comes out over here. So it scatters the light and, and sort of a giveaway because it's right on the surface. All you're doing is changing a few surface atoms and all of a sudden the glass isn't transparent anymore in the sense that there's no, it doesn't render images anymore. It just produces light at the other side. Now what's the wave theory for that? How does this wave theory, okay, of some sort of consistent vibration and then it pops out at the other end, why would abrading the surface change that so clearly <laughs> it's a it this is really dependent on this being the, this middle of the glass is very rigid in terms of its geometry the surface of the glass can be made unrigid can be broken if you polish it you keep consistency in the lattice if you don't if you rough it up you've broken the consistency of the lattice and therefore the transmission quality of the glass. All right, we'll just play a little bit. See, I, I don't think he says anything more, but, uh, you know, I mean, it just then goes on to another theory, I mean, which is, you know, even wackier than the first theory. That is that the photon hits the glass, moves every possible path, <laughs> all right, and then does the silly recombining at the other side of the glass to pop out. I think it's silly. Just, I mean, in, I hate incredibly silly. I mean, really silly. Not even, no chance that's the right answer. Come on. It just, no chance that's the right answer. Okay, so even if each individual wave that you're producing could be traveling at the speed of light, the, the kind of the superposition of them then creates something that's actually sort of is one of retarded. It hasn't traveled quite as far as you expected it to. So the net effect of adding the light that comes in with all the light that you end up generating through jiggling all the individual atoms. All right, so imagine that this is one photon that's causing all of this somehow. So, I mean, isn't that kind of magical? Produces 
use this picture of a, the, the overall way that you end up with by adding all that lot together is traveling slow. Yeah, like I said, see, see, it's one thing to say, okay, you have a string of electrons and they're all bound by force, okay? So they're all repelling each other by a, by a static pressure. And the pressure between each one of these electrons is exactly the same because they balance. The balance for, is forced on them. So if I irregularly, if I create a little tiny bit of extra pressure here, it will automatically balance. And then you could argue the photon's doing the same thing. Photon comes in, creates an imbalance here, that imbalance has to regulate through all of the movement of these electrons. So it has to subtly vibrate the electrons, subtly vibrate this one, subtly vibrate this one, and those are at um, kind of a dampen. It takes time for the, the electrons to dampen, and when they finally do dampen, the end result's going to be this feels the pressure, releases the photon. And the problem is, if you actually want to do what, you know, rather than just sitting here waving your hand about, if I actually wanted to show you that actually the speed that the, the net result of adding all these waves together is to produce a wave which is traveling at less than the speed of light, that's a lot of maths. So that's a lot of math. So he's conceding the math would be insane because there's an insane number of interactions and uh, it wouldn't be any fun and blah, 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 but that there's somehow you can mathematically make that happen. I would argue you can mathematically make almost anything happen. And so you can do it by solving the, you know, solving the equations of what happens if I add all these different ways together, each in different phase shifts and so on. Um, but it's just a mathematical mess to get to that point. So when, when Barry, the beam of light, entered a piece of glass and, all, and, and started making all the bits of glass start jiggling, how did that then affect Barry, the beam of light? It didn't. Except, well, some of Barry's energy was lost because actually... Some of Barry's energy was lost. Now, that's not possible because then the photon would come out a different color, theoretically, because they think energy is associated with frequency somehow, which it's not. Clearly, it can't have lost energy. Clearly, Barry the photon got buried in the glass, and the glass is going to make a new Barry the photon. I think that's pretty clear. It was being used to jiggle all these other things around, so some of that light would have been lost for that reason. But it was then all these friends that Barry had created in the process, and the sum of all those different waves then created the net effect, the net wave that was traveling through the thing, which was a then a wave which was traveling at less than. Right, so Barry really doesn't come out the other end. The friends make a new Barry. He didn't say that. What is it about all those friends, all that extra waveness that was summed onto Barry, that retarded him rather than enhancing him and making him faster? In fact, you can, in very peculiar circumstances, create things where you end up with a wave which is traveling faster than the speed of light in vacuum. Physicists tend to try and keep quiet about this because it makes life complicated. And it turns out, actually, you don't end up, you know, everyone gets worried because at that point you end up saying, am I breaking the laws of physics, am I breaking relativity, and so on. Actually, you don't because then you start saying, okay, so can I actually travel, to transfer any information through this medium? Can I use this to actually get information to travel faster than the speed of light? And the answer is you can't. Because there's two types of, of speed for a wave. There's a thing called its phase speed, which is what I've been talking up to up till now about. There's also a thing called its group speed. And the group speed is if, for example, you wanted to produce a little pulse of light, how fast would that pulse propagate through? And the group speed, and that's what you need if you actually wanted to send... Yeah, yeah, the group speed can't go that fast. But anyway, the other speed doesn't go that fast either. But anyway, the, you know, just more... I mean, so this is enough. Holiday hears this and he says, yes, I get all of that. That's really on target. That's, that's nail in the coffin evidence that photons are waves. This is somehow nail in the coffin evidence and now we don't need to even talk about anything. You know, we have the answer. This is rock solid. Right. The information is going to do Morse code or whatever. I've got to send little pulses of light through it. The group speed always ends up less than the speed of light. The phase speed under peculiar circumstances can end up uh, faster than the speed of light rather than slower than the speed of light. So that, that's... Right, so he's just basically saying somehow that in moments of the transmission of a wave, it could so a little bit faster than the speed of light, and it goes a little slower than the speed of light. But overall, it ends up being the speed of light, which, is my opinion, is bullshit. That's the classical explanation. Okay, the simplest version of the quantum picture is to say actually it's kind of the same thing because. <laughs> yeah, see, actually the same thing. You hear it? I mean, it's just hilarious, right? So he thinks the classic Newtonian picture is already the wave picture. So we've already, we, we've so annihilated Newton that 
He's, he's not classical anymore. They don't even consider him artifactal. He just doesn't exist at all. And they're just comparing, oh, well, our old wave theory versus our new modern wave theory. Wave, 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 wave. I mean, it's just they can't imagine things traveling at a frequency. It just can't, there can't exist in the universe now. It is a wave. You shoot your gun three times a second, it's a wave of bullets. They're not just bullets three seconds apart, uh, one-third of a second apart. No, it's waving! It thinks that photons have really weird properties, right? For example, if you do this experiment of having two slits and you shine light through it, you end up creating an interference pattern. Right. Well, why don't you say uh, the weirder one is you have this one slit and somehow it interferes with itself. Why don't you do that one first? Why don't you bring up the one slit first? Because that's the more bizarre thing, you see? You should bring up the more bizarre one first. You know, if you're going to be fair to bizarro world, if we're going to go to bizarro land, uh, you ought to go to the real one, the original, like Disneyland. You've got to go to Disneyland first, then you can go to Disneyland. Um, just because the light that went through one bit, slit interferes with the light that went through another slit. So it's kind of the same, actually. Story. Right, right. It interferes with the light that went through the other slit. But we know there isn't light going through the other slit. And certainly in the single slit, we know there's no light going through the other s s slit. It all has to go through the one slit. It Right, different paths. A single photon takes different paths. So again, we're right back to the silly mush, and now he's going to argue for the infinite paths. It takes every possible path. But actually, if you think about things in terms of photons, even if you have a light source which is so weak that only one photon is going through at a time, you still create an interference band. And the only way we can understand that is if the photon actually went through both states. Right. So, so there we go. The only way we can understand it now, I don't have to do that, and I don't have to do it for a, a rational reason. In that, that's silly. That's the silly conclusion. Okay, that's that's saying, well, let's allow leprechauns and and fairies to exist on planet Earth and start explaining events. So there's a bunch of leprechauns that made evil fairies, and they're inside Trump's brain or something. You know, and then we'll explain what's happening in the world based on fairies and leprechauns. You know, and that's all they're doing here. Once, once, you, once you do this silly thing of saying, well, I, I won't try to find a rational explanation. I'll do something totally irrational and think photons know how to split in half and go through both sides and create round waves. <laughs> you know, they know how to do that. They have a reason to create a round wave, right? The photons are coming in flat in in the sense that there's no roundness to anything, right? They're coming in as flat waves of bullets, let's say. And, but they're going to leave going round. But they're not like water, so they don't have friction with the other sides of it, like water does. Water goes round because water has surface tension and friction with the sides, the surfaces it's getting past. So the water that's on the surfaces slows down, and the water not hitting the surfaces stays the same speed, you see, and that creates the round bulge, the surface tension of the water. Where, where's the excuse for round waves being created by a photon? Oh, there's no excuse. That's fairy. Uh, leprechaun, it goes through both slits. Fairy, it goes round. I mean, it's completely not a real well-founded or logical explanation, and yet this it, it, Hothaday says this proves I'm wrong. Fuck. Amazing. So he, one particle can use to go from both slits at once, and this is getting us into this weird... Right, right, right. So if you brought up the single slit, then you'd have to say something even sillier, which is one particle goes in and splits in two for no reason whatsoever. Quantum mechanical world. Okay. We can do the same thing with our solid of saying, okay, so if I think of my light as a bunch of photons, I can actually think of a photon following every possible path through this thing. And as it goes through, it interacts with each of the individual atoms, gets re-radiated, and what I see in, 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 uh, as the kind of... And then somehow the other side of the glass knows how to add all of that up and create one photon leaving.
the final light that this is producing is the, the superposition of all those things. The superposition of the light, the photon that came in undisturbed. But <clears throat> Again, I, I don't know why they use this superposition argument, just because it's sort of just breaking the idea of superposition, you know, which is you have forces coming from different things, and they don't mean anything until you put something that can add them up. The something adds them up. You have to have a, a material thing to be affected by the forces. The forces themselves will not interact with each other until you put matter there, and then they will. But also all these other parts that it followed interacting with all the atoms on the way through. And that really is basically the same as the classical picture, where we kind of each atom is sort of producing its own. Okay, so I, like I said, nowhere near the same, nothing, there, there's no way to make this traveling every, the theoretically al almost infinite number of paths into the same. It's not the same. The, the, it, it's it's non-conservational. It can't be any kind of real force because you couldn't make any conservational sense out of how it could possibly do all of those interactions where the energy came from. Version of the light. Here. I, I mean, you can't move electrons without applying energy to them. You can't vibrate an atom without applying energy to it. How can the photon be it simultaneously vibrating all these different paths? It's just thinking about the photon following every possible path, and then those photons, that, that photon by following every possible path, ends up interfering with itself and creating a net effect of light that's traveling slower than the speed of light. Where do you... So, so that's enough for half a day. Draw the line, though. If, this, if our photon is going through every possible way, and we add up the superposition, every possible way seems like an infinite thing. It could have... I guess, yes, it's very terrible how a photon manages to follow every possible path to get to where it's going. Nonetheless, that seems to be when you do the maths of say, what would I expect to see? <laughs> yeah, when you do the silly maths that don't even have the slits in the math, uh, and, but you do the silly math with the Huygens catch, you know, that, that, you know, again, so do the math with the silly presumptions underlying it. Leprechaun, fairies. So as long as you have leprechauns and fairies before you do the math, you'll be okay. If that's the way the photons were behaving, and then look at the real universe, you find actually that's the way the real universe works. Mm, no, you don't. You really don't. There's simple variables, and we know some of them. We know we polish the glass, we change the equation. We know lots of things that you can affect to change the effect. And some of them are, he, he acknowledged, but just brushed over. Again, like the fact that the different frequencies of light travel a different speed. That's sort of an indication that somehow the glass is sensitive to frequency. And that wouldn't have anything to do with infinite path stuff. <laughs> I understand you gave two, two scenarios here. This classical one, yeah. uh, you know, jiggling and the adding of the waves and, that, and this... Um, so, so it really isn't classical. It's two wave theories. So he gave two wave theories. He didn't give a particle theory. The one which is a bit more mind-bending, but nevertheless the maths works. The maths works for both of them. Yes. I accept that. Which one is actually happening? <laughs> that, so that's the problem with physics, right? Is that physics, what we're doing is we're modeling reality. There's one... Right, right. And you're modeling reality with a, assumptions like, oh yeah, the photon splits in two and goes through both slits. Sure. Photons are really big and it got broken into two pieces and it, you know, one piece took that piece that hit the middle and it just pushed it right through one of the holes so it didn't lose anything because we have to have conservation. So it doesn't make any sense. Reality, you can have multiple models, and sometimes the models are exactly all, you know, as far as we can tell, there's no... You know. Yeah, yeah, you, you can't have multiple models if you're after the truth, so let's just uh, play this game that the two models can both be right. The, what they can be is both wrong. Both of your stupid models can be stupid models. That is a possibility, all right? One of them could be right and one of them can be wrong, or both of them could be bullshit. I would vote for they're probably both bullshit. The models are entirely right. In other cases, each model kind of captures some aspect of reality. In this case, you can sort of explain the whole thing in terms of the quantum model. There are things you can't explain in the classical model. So in that sense, 
the quantum model is more right. But actually, the classical model is very helpful because it's much easier to picture. And actually, you don't end up with these mind-bending things of one photon following an infinite number of possible paths and those kinds of things. So actually, a lot of the time, it makes sense to think about things in terms of classical physics, just because it's soluble, we can understand what's going on, we have a physical intuition for what's going on. But once in a while, you have to delve into the quantum mechanics. Right. So he says you have to do that, and there's no reason you have to do that. And and frankly, his rationale for how one's more descriptive, he doesn't explain how it's more descriptive. So again, he just likes it better. He likes the sillier model better. He didn't explain why it's more thorough or complete or accurate. Just to mess things up still further, there's another quantum way of looking at this, which is this. Um, and, and again, it's this question of coming up with ways of modeling things. So I'll just talk about two ways of modeling things. There's another way of modeling things that says, actually, a system that's a kind of a, a lattice or whatever that's in your, your material and the light traveling through it is completely different from just light in a vacuum. And so actually, we shouldn't just think of you know, light in a vacuum we can explain as a photon. This combination of light plus the lattice and all the way that the lattice can be made to jiggle is a completely different system. And when we come to solve that completely different system, maybe we'll come up with a completely different particle rather than a photon as the, as the particle that's associated with light. And so physicists who study these systems have actually come up with a different way of mathematically formulating these things where there is a different kind of particle, a thing called a polariton. And a polariton. So they invented, a, you know, it's like dark matter. We just invent a vehicle for what we want to exist and there doesn't have to be a single shred of evidence that the damn thing exists. Nothing. So if that isn't a pixie now, so we have fairies and leprechauns and now pixies. Polariton. Pixies. Polariton is it's this complex combination of the oscillations of the electromagnetic waves of the light and the oscillations of all the stuff in the material it's passing through combined together produce this kind of particle. This kind of particle, the polariton, has mass. And because it has mass, that means it travels at less than the speed of light. So if you want a, a different... Yeah, we already know the, the, the electrons will do that. So all you do is have the photon hit an electron, have to wait for the electron to go somewhere, and then be readmitted to the freeness. So again, it, you know, so the other explanation by the other physicist was more in that line of electrons are doing the, the action. And <clears throat> he got called out, apparently, on the idea of the um, photon actually changing the en energy level of electrons. I don't know why he de decided to abandon that. So now he's saying they somehow just move the electron but don't change its energy level. They just wobble it or something. But that wouldn't explain how you release a new photon. So that's the only downside to what he's saying. But regardless, the idea is the electrons absorb and emit photons. And that's what they do regularly. So if you move the electron, you can create a new photon. And that's sort of my argument. I'm arguing that there's pressure between electrons, and that pressure is really photons. And so when you move an electron, you release a photon. <laughs> Just because you moved it, you are now allowed this pressure to be released. And how that all balances to create exactly the right frequencies and all that stuff is probably complex in the sense that we, it's going to be hard for us to know exactly how they move. But the point would be is the electron actually moves this way in a little, and that's why the electron comes out at the same frequency. That it, The energy of the frequency it went in with, the two hits, will end up leaving the same way, but or something like that. But I'm just saying that mechanics is sort of, that's classical electrodynamics. Moving electrons and creating photons is classical electrodynamics. And that should be separated from wave theories. All right, anyway. Ugh, longer than I thought it would take, but anyway, enough said. And so, until next time and such. I don't think there's anything else. The way of thinking these things, but also a quantum mechanical one, is that your photon comes along, when it enters this medium, the maths that you're solving changes, and so actually the particle changes, and instead of being a photon, it becomes one of these things, a polariton. The polariton bimbles along at a bit less than the speed of light, and of course when it comes out the other side, then once again you're solving the regular equations of light. Right, so again, nothing would bindle along inside of glass. High, very dense, lots of atoms in it, nothing bindles along. It, it would, the polariton would end up crashing into all kinds of shit, so it's not a very good answer, in my opinion. In a vacuum, the light in air, and that means that you can then treat it as a photon again and it just scoots off at the speed of light again. 
So, I mean, if I did this, if I had three different explanations, all wacky, wackier, and wackiest, um, you know, I'd be ripped new asshole all over the place. I'd be mocked and ridiculed. And, no, these guys are revered. Oh, that's so brilliant. Oh, that's magnificent. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll use that to mock other people's theories, because that's just so fucking brilliant. That's what you get. That's the hypocrisy and duplicity of these fanatics. These are their little popes and their little ministers, their little bishops and their little priests. And they can do no wrong. They can molest no facts. No, they love facts. They don't molest facts. <laughs> Fuck. Hey, look, nice enough guy, but I'm just saying this, the arrogance of these people to say, we've got an answer. We've got the answer. When... They don't even have an answer, technically, that's better than Dr. Seuss's. You know, Dr. Seuss probably has better physics. I mean, fuck. How do you expect me to do <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I told you the physics. The only thing's your fault. Yeah, yeah, I told you the physics. No, you told me multiple physicses, and none of them sound like anything, anything in the rational. They're Fred Flintstone monkey camera. I mean, this stuff just doesn't sound right.